today, I feel like I got this. It's the king of one-hit wonders, people, Mr. Rob Van Winkle, also known as Vanilla Ice. If you know it, sing it with me. All right, stop. Collaborate and listen. Ice is back with my brand new invention. Something grabs a hold of me tightly. Flow like a harpoon daily and nightly. Will it ever stop? Yo, I don't know. Turn off the lights and I'll blow to the extreme. I'll rock a mic like a vandal. Light up a stage and wax a chump like a candle. Come on. Come on. Here at TLC, we make karaoke dreams come true. Just come on, talk to me. We will make your dream come true. We started a series last week called One Hit Wonders where we look at some of the more obscure people in the Bible, but for a short time they had a huge impact in the world around them to the point that they made it into the Bible. So that has to tell you a little bit about the character of these people. I wonder if you could choose to be known for something, what would it be that you would be known for? In a world where fame and rewards are solely what uh, society says to pursue, I wonder how many of us would want to have at the end of our life this Hollywood walk of fame lifestyle, where all of our friends and fans come together and watch us get our star unveiled on the walk of fame. I wonder uh, if we're being honest with ourselves, how many of us really would like that? For the past two decades, I've been on stages across the nation, and uh, in some way or the other, good or bad, I've had influence on people's lives because I've had a microphone in front of me. And it's been a good gig. Like, I love Jesus. I love that I've gotten to sing about God and make a living from it. But it doesn't come without some sort of a price. Some sort of a price mainly from a prideful standpoint. When you're, in, when you're on stage, oftentimes you can start thinking that you're really good. You can start praising the gifts more than the giver. And we're just prone to naturally want to receive credit. That's just the way we are. It's the proverbial catch-22. Like, I want to do something great for God, but I also want some of the credit. I want somebody to remember me. And every single person in this life will struggle with this to some degree. But when you're on stage, you want it even more. And the hard part is taking that praise and reflecting it to a God that deserves the praise. Because if we're really being honest... We can talk ourselves into thinking that we deserve the praise. I have done it many times in my life. And the crazy thing about success is the more success that you get, the more you want it, the more you crave it. So what makes these obscure people in the Bible so marvelous is that they didn't care about being the star. They weren't seeking stardom. They just wanted to use the gift that God had given them in any way possible to advance the kingdom of God. The person I'm going to talk about this morning is probably somebody that you won't even recognize, and yet there's an entire book in the New Testament written specifically to this man. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 3 John. This is a, right uh, close to the very end of the Bible, 3 John, Jude, and then Revelation, so it's way, way back there. Uh, it'll be on the screen if you don't have it. This is John writing to this man, and he says this. The elder, this is what John refers to himself as, the elder in um, uh, 2 John and 3 John. He says, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testify about your faithfulness to the Lord, or to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in the truth. So, son, so John sends this letter to a man named Gaius. And he says, man, I just want to continue to encourage you. You're doing an awesome job. And it appears in verse 4 that he is some sort of spiritual leader to guys, some sort of discipling person in his life, almost like a, a, a spiritual father to him. And I don't think that's a literal translation when he says, uh, when I see my children serving the Lord. But I think the literal translation, he calls him dear friend twice in this, in this chapter. But I can tell you, as somebody that has tried to buy into other people's lives, it does bring great joy when those people start growing in their faith and they buy into other people's lives and start discipling. Before we move on, and this is not a sermon on John, it's going to be a sermon on Gaius, I do want to just say, ask a question real quick. Um, who are you discipling? Two weeks ago, I ended the sermon with the Great Commission, and it wasn't something that we should just take lightly. Like, if you want to do this, Jesus said, go and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Change the world. 
So who are you discipling? Nate talked last week about Barnabas, and Barnabas was known as an encourager. And he encouraged us to go and encourage people. So did you do that this week? Did you reach out to somebody and encourage them? Step out of your comfort zone and, and worship our God and creator in a way where he gets all the glory by blessing other people. It's part of discipling, caring about people, living a life to help those people grow in knowing who Jesus is. And as Nate said, it's never been easier with technology. You can be halfway around the world and you can send a text or an email and almost immediately get it and encouragement can come their way. I encourage you to do that. John was that person for Gaius and now it seems like Gaius has come into his own. He's now making an impact on the local church where he's at. He goes on to say in verses five through eight, dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that they may work together for the truth. John says that Gaius is faithful in taking care of these strangers. Now, all the commentaries I read this week would, would all kind of agree that it seems like he's taking care of physical needs, but also that he's housing them. As it goes on to say, uh, to send them on their way, which would imply that they've been staying with him. And I think uh, verse 7 is really interesting. It says, it was for the sake of the name. You guys see that the name is capitalized that they went out. That name is a pronoun for Christ. In the New Testament, we don't really hear the word Christianity all that often, just a few times. That's something that we talk about nowadays as followers of Jesus Christ. Paul usually referred to it as the way. John refers to it as the name here. Can you imagine opening up your house to strangers? Just complete strangers. Now, I know that they're ministers of the gospel, and I know that they should be godly people. That doesn't mean they're godly people, and now you've opened up your house to them. You've opened up your lives to them. You've opened up your family to them. And that's what Gaius has done. That's what he did to, to try to change this world. John saw it worthy of what he did. It was so important that he wrote a letter that would end up being one of the books in the Bible. And one could say, well, look, Gaius isn't really all that important. He's never on stage. We don't even know if we're saying his name correctly. It doesn't appear to have any Instagram followers. Like, we don't know much about this dude. And somehow this nobody has now made it in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible, because he lived in his wheelhouse and he did what God opened the door for him to do. He would appear to be a nobody and yet he changed the world. My very first time ever in Michigan was last January, 2017. All the years that I traveled in music, I don't, maybe in the 90s, but I can't remember ever being in Michigan. So we had been praying about starting a church up here. Most of you guys have heard the story. Nate is from here, and my wife and I said, well, let's go up there and let's see what it's like. We came up in January. This is how you know that God has called you. If you come to, Jan to Michigan in January and you go through with it, you know that God's just called you, right? Because it's freezing cold. We started praying about it. We got connected to the school. We started praying with the school, seeing if there could be some sort of agreement. We came to a, an agreement to start the church here. My wife and I said, you know, we need to buy a house. We just need to move on forward with this. And so we talked with Noel. Noel showed us houses. We bought a house before we even signed the contract with the school, which is not my best negotiating day ever because then they're like, dude, you bought a house. Like you have to start a church now. You're gonna have to sign with us. We just knew it. We knew in our heart of hearts that this is where God was calling us. Now, we got a good deal on our house and we thought let's remodel it before we move in. So we started remodeling this house insert Dr. Tom Watkins and Miss Shelley Watkins. If you don't know them, they're two amazing people. Dr. Tom is the head of the school board, and he said, why don't you just stay with us at our house? Now, when I say we're doing a remodel, I'm talking like I gutted this thing. I pulled all the kitchen cabinets out, all the flooring, brand new appliances, new everything. It's just like, might as well do this while we're not living here. I was still living in Kentucky, still working at our church, so I would go down there on the weekends and I would do our services and then drive back up for four or five days and work on the house. Week after week after week, these two amazing people let me stay in their house. A stranger in all reality. And I remember they called me one time, Miss Shelley, and she said, are you going to be up next week? I said, yes. She said, well, we're going to be out of town. I was like, oh, well, no, no problem. I'll stay at a hotel. She's like, no, no, no. We'll just leave you a key. 
And they didn't just let me stay there. They gave me the presidential treatment. Like, Miss Shelley makes a chocolate cake that I will fight you for. I ain't playing games. And she makes homemade ice cream. And every single day, and I'm not joking. This is, this is very serious. Every single day, I would come in from like a 12 to 15 hour work day. I'd be completely dirty. And they would be waiting up for me. And I would sit at their table. And they would serve me homemade chocolate cake and ice cream. And they would love me. And they would encourage me. And they would pray for me. A stranger. Because they believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ advancing. Any credit that will ever be given out in heaven, I truly believe that one day they will be rewarded in the same way that Gaius was rewarded because they believed in the Great Commission and changing lives. And yet 10 years down the road, when you think of the history of this church, very few people will ever remember that because they're not on stage, they're not seen. They're easily forgotten in the story. Here's the problem with servanthood. It's easily forgotten. It's easily overlooked. And that's why we, creatures that are prone to be prideful, don't like it. We don't necessarily want to gravitate to it. Gaius wasn't who he was to make a name for himself. He just wasn't. He was just using what he had, his desire to see the kingdom of God advancing and helping ministers and teachers do exactly what they needed to do without hindering them. Proverbs 27, 2 says this. Let someone else praise you, not your own mouth, an outsider, and not your own lips. This is exactly the life that Gaius lived, never seeking praise, never being self-serving, just being faithful and supportive in any way he can. And now he's in the Bible. He's become known. His wheelhouse wasn't preaching or teaching. There's nothing that would suggest that. His wheelhouse was hospitality, and it garnered the praise of the church, made its way all the way back to John, which made John so proud. We have any baseball fans in here? Anybody like baseball? I'm not a big baseball fan, but here's why. It's, it's nothing personal. I just didn't grow up playing it. I have ADD. It's way too slow pace for me, and it's like 160 games or something like that. It's way, it's just a long, long season. But I could see how people could get into baseball. I really could. You come out there, you got your peanuts, and you're hanging out with your friends, and it's beautiful outside. I get it. Do you know what accounts for most scored runs? Just base hits. Base hits highly outrank home runs as to what wins games in baseball. And yet our natural inclination is to want to be the home run king and to knock it out of the park. And yet, base hits are what wins the game. It's the mindset that says, I would love to hit a home run, but in all reality, uh, I'm probably gonna strike out. But what I can do is I can play my role. I can go over the first baseman and hit it in the gap and let the next guy get the game-winning RBI and be on TV. You guys have heard me say that I think Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time. I will die on that hill, people. Kristen Hill, say it. Agree with me. Don't boo me. Tom Brady is security. Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time, and he rarely throws the long ball. What he does is he picks defenses apart five yards at a time. And guess what wins football games? Five yards at a time. Learning to play the role that God has created you to play will literally change the world around you. It just will. It will impact every single person that sees you on a daily basis. Nathan mentioned last week that he was a son of encouragement. His mom is a super sweet lady. If you don't know her, you need to get to know her. She's awesome. She gave up her Mother's Day to be back with kids, but not just her. It was almost all mothers that were back there last week. The one day that we should not have mothers be in kids' church should be Mother's Day, right? We should give them that opportunity. But this is what they know. They know how to nurture kids. And they're like, you know what? Well, I can be used. I can help the kingdom of God advance. I can serve in any way that I possibly can, and I can do this. So all you mothers who gave up your Sunday, your Mother's Day to be with kids, thank you so much. And all the people who serve at this church, just thank you for what you do there's nothing to suggest that Gaius was some special guy with, with awesome gifts or even used in a public arena in any way. Yet he lived in his wheelhouse and it advanced the kingdom of God. That could be any one of us. It could be Dr. Tom and Miss Shelley. That could be Gaius. We just have to lose the mindset that says, well, if I can do this, 
then I'll step in. If I can get on stage or if I can teach this, if I can do this and just say, I'll do whatever I can possibly do. A couple weeks ago here at church, sorry, here at school, it's the same thing in my mind. Um, There was grandparents day. My dad couldn't make it up. Cindy's mom couldn't make it up. And so my daughter was pretty torn up about this. And she's just sweet like that. She's She gets her feelings hurt pretty easy like that. And she was like, I just wish Papa could be here. And then Rick and Sue Almer said, we'll step in. We'll be their grandparents. We would love to. And not only that, they like sent a card saying thank you for letting them be. Like they just lived in their wheelhouse, by the way. Happy birthday to Rick today. Love you, my friend. Yeah, come on. (laughs) We're not all supposed to be on stage. And as glamorous as it might seem in your mind, it comes at a price. You need to have that calling. And even then, it's brutal at times. But we can all serve. I mean, we can all change the world by serving other people. You don't have to have a perfectly kept house to invite people over. Listen, let's just talk about this real quick. I know what the lines are in carpet. I know what that means. Because they don't last long. I know you just vacuumed right before I walked in. I know that because there's lines. It doesn't ever look that way any other day of the week. And I also know this. Somewhere in your house, you're not fooling anybody. You have a closet like Monica had in Friends that all your junk is thrown in. I get it. People don't care as much as they care that you love them and accept them and welcome them. We can all do that. We're created to have that desire to need community. We just are. Gaius was proving that he could help uh, create this community to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to do the same thing. So John says these great things about this man named Gaius that has affected the church. But then he goes on and says, this is what it looks like that somebody that doesn't have the same mindset as you. He said, I wrote to the church, but but Diotrophes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he's doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us, not satisfied with that. He even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who do so and puts them out of the church. It would appear that this man, Diotrophes, that was in this church that he's talking about had the Hollywood walk of fame kind of mentality. Whatever it took, I just want people to know me. John says that he loves to be first. Can you imagine, remember what I opened the sermon with? Well, I opened it with an awesome rap, which you guys should never forget. But I opened it with this question asking you guys if you could be known for anything. How many would want to be known as they love to win? Versus a guy like Gaius that says, I just want to help in any way that I can. Whatever it took, even to the point of not really being known or ever getting credit, I don't care if I'm first. I don't care if I'm in front of people. I will help advance the gospel of Jesus Christ where, right where I am at. Paul said this in Philippians. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. I think it's safe to say that this is the kind of person that Gaius was. He just wasn't caring about himself or making a name or be self-serving. He just wanted others to succeed because he knew when other people succeeded, the gospel of Jesus Christ advanced. You guys remember the theme song to Cheers? Anybody? I'm kind of dating myself. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. We all can fall into that trap. Living a life that we want people to know who we are. This is what's happened with this man, Diotrophes. Like Paul, I mean, John says, I'm going to deal with this guy when I get there. Like he's slandering. He's actually stopping the gospel from advancing because he's so prideful. And being first really isn't first. Like we glamorize people and lifestyles as if they are the pinnacle of success. They're on the top of the world, but I'm telling you, it's a facade. It's a glass house. It will come crumbling down. Did anybody see what Justin Bieber tweeted, or not tweeted, uh, posted on Instagram two weeks ago? Any Justin Bieber followers? Don't act like you don't follow Justin Bieber. He's got 95 million people that follow him on Instagram. 
105 million people who follow him on Twitter. Now, I'm not the smartest, but that's 200 million people following this guy. And he, he tweeted or uh, put something out about the star-studded Met Gala, like this big gala that happens. And he said this. He said, hey, world, that glamorous lifestyle that you see portrayed by famous people on Instagram, don't be fooled thinking their life is better than yours. I can promise you it's not. Being at the top is not the goal, nor is it real. I have some friends who are in a multi, multi million selling CD album. Like they've, they've sold millions and millions of albums. And I remember a couple years ago, one of them called me while he was on the road in uh, Germany. They were on a world tour. And he was so depressed. And he couldn't stop addictions. And he just needed me to pray for him. It was like day after day after day. And he was so lonely. Like being at the top really isn't at the top. We just glamorize it. You see, we were created to connect people to God. So anything that we would try to replace that with will fall apart at some point, just like a glass house. Helping other know, others know who Christ is, is the goal. Helping people feel loved and accepted is the goal. I'm as competitive as anyone as you'll ever meet. The older I get, the more competitive I am, and my body doesn't handle it as well. But if you said, Todd, we can take a ball right here and kick it to that door without touching the door. Whoever gets it closest wins. I will stay here all day until I beat you. It's just the way I am. I love to win. I love to play games. I love to play basketball. I love to play against Nate, and I hate it all at the same time. Like, I talk smack, but Nate's really good at basketball. Anybody that's played with him knows that. Nate can light you up. Every once in a while, I can beat him. And it, like, it changes my month. I'm just like, you remember that? <laughs> you know what happened. He's like, shut up. Like, as much as I still feel the need to compete with Nate in basketball or tennis or at the gym, when it comes to the gospel advancing, there is no competition. All I want for Nate Zimmerman is to help him in any way that I possibly can for this kingdom of God to advance. That's all I want. Because being competitive and hindering aren't the same thing. As much as I love competition, the gospel is not about competition. It's about playing our roles in any way we can to help the next person advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can all do that. That, in essence, is what discipling looks like, caring about others, helping the gospel advance. And it probably won't be natural for every one of us, but every one of us can do it. You don't have to have a special calling from God to care about people. You just have to be willing to open up your life with other people. That's why we're going to be unfolding these connect groups so that you can connect with other people. I'm telling you, I'm, we're here every week. I see a lot of you that come in and never say anything to anyone else and just walk out. We were, we were built to have community. There will be no lone rangers in heaven. Like we were built to love people. God wired us that way. The same way he wired us to have community with him. So I encourage you as we go and, and launch these uh, connect groups that you guys would get involved. You don't have to be on a stage to make an impact on someone's life. You just don't. You just have to be willing to open up your life. Open up your house. Jesus, throughout the gospel, spent time having lunch and dinner with people. He just hung out with them. Just caring about people. Gaius isn't a superhero of the faith. You're not going to find him in Hebrews 11 where we look at the wall of fame of these amazing faithful people and yet he made it in the Bible and advanced the kingdom of God. At the church that Nate and I came from in Lexington, Kentucky, it's called Northeast Christian Church. It's a great church. We had two pastors that we rolled up to. Our lead pastor, Monty Wilkinson, amazing guy. And then the executive pastor, his name was Steve Smith. He was the more operations guy, so we would roll up to him on an org chart. Steve was an interesting guy because he worked for the church for free. He was semi-retired. He just loved people. He just cared about people. So he was like, he worked for the church for free. He and Miss Pat, his wife, are successful They've been blessed with good businesses to make their lifestyle easier than most people. And yet, if you went over to their house, it's a bit unassuming. It's an older home. It's updated. It's nice. But you quickly realize as you get to know them that relationships are way more important to them than any material thing in this world. For four years, I was at that church, and almost every single Sunday, 
Almost every single Sunday for four years, they would take me and my family out to lunch after church is over, along with the lead pastor and his family, and then any newcomers in the church. I'm talking 10 to 30 people. And Steve's not the guy that wants you to get chicken fingers. He's like, dude, get a steak. I want you to get a steak. Get whatever you want. Here's 15,000 appetizers. Get whatever you want. He would just pay for it. He just wanted you to feel welcome. They started a small group years and years ago called Journeys, where they just disciple young families. It's now the biggest part of that church as far as like when it comes to community. It's a huge part of the church. And every year they take these families on an all-expense getaway where they pay for everything because they believe in relationships. And something that Steve really has taught me was discipling happens when relationships start. Now look, you might not have finances to be able to do that, but you can probably afford hot dogs. Hot dogs are cheap, right? Just invite people over. It has nothing to do with finances as much as it has to do with a mentality that says, I want to live for other people to succeed, whatever that takes. They're amazing people, and most people know Pat and Steve Smith at Northeast, but not because they have stage time. Steve might preach twice a year. I've never seen Miss Pat on stage with a microphone. But they've changed people's lives one person at a time, one relationship at a time. Jesus said, the greatest among you will be a servant. And then he proved it by serving. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Gaius is a great example to all of us of what the Lord is looking for. Sacrifice and humility will change the course of your life. And it will advance the gospel. Becoming a people group that chooses to love people more than we love ourselves. Love helping people get to their desires and fulfill their dreams more than we care about our own. That's what the church is for. To grow people into knowing who Jesus is. I have a person in my life that's been the the greatest encourager throughout my entire career. If I said, I think I can climb Mount Everest, they would go out and buy me the tools to do it. Now, listen, I'm not climbing anything. I'm very lazy when it comes to climbing. Not going to do that. But that's how much they believe in me. I've told you that I'm a preacher's kid. My parents were amazing people. They taught me the love of Jesus. But there's something special about somebody other than your parents buying into your life. Someone besides your parents discipling you. This person has been that to me my entire life. It's my Aunt Pat. She's amazing. She's like a second mom to me. And when it seemed like no one else would believe in me, my Aunt Pat's like, you got this. When me and my buddies said we want to start a church in Denver in 2004. We had no financial backing. We just knew we wanted to start a church that we would want to go to and invite people to. My Aunt Pat came alongside and said, you know what? I'll co-sign the contract for you. We couldn't have done it without her. And then she didn't stop there. She said, "Uh, I'll pay for all the renovations. I think it was $38,000 to renovate this building to get it up to code. She said, I got this. She played the role of Gaius. She's like, I'm not called to be out front, but these guys are. They're called to advance the gospel, so whatever I can do, I'm gonna help them with. That church is Red Rocks Church. It's now one of the biggest churches and fastest growing churches in America. 14,000 people will meet this weekend at that church. Thousands of people have come to Christ because of what God has done there, and I can promise you, that about 99.9% of the people will never know who my aunt is. Yet you take her out of the equation, my life and that church looks drastically different. She played the role that God gave her. And she did it in humility. And she never cared about being known. Still to this day, she doesn't care about receiving any of the credit. She just stuck with the wheelhouse that she was good at, what God had called her to do. I think about Nate and Kristen Hill, the bearded wonder. If you don't know the bearded wonder that serves coffee, you got to get to know him. Awesome guy. Kristen's got a bad attitude because she doesn't like Tom Brady, so you can just love and pray for her. But 
Nate said before church actually started, before we started in October, he said, man, I love coffee. Can I oversee coffee? Can I just take care of it? It's his wheelhouse, right? He loves coffee. It's something he can just do. I don't even drink coffee. I'm like, knock yourself out. I wouldn't know what's good or what's bad. It's getting your wheelhouse and, and doing something for the kingdom to help it advance. Just quick side note, if you love coffee, help them out. They need people to help in that area, especially next weekend. Thank you guys for serving. We can all be like this. We can all choose to find a way to buy into other people's lives, to serve where no one sees us, to live a life that's easily forgotten and easily overlooked so that Jesus Christ always receives the glory. The greatest life you could ever live, including myself. And no matter how small you think your gift is, when you put it in the hands of God, it becomes powerful beyond any measure that you could conjure up on your own. After church, when we get together for eating, breaking bread together, hanging out, connect with people. There's some of you who have been a follower of Jesus Christ for a long time. Start discipling each other. It's never gonna happen until we connect. Let's pray. God, help us to understand that that mindset as much as society would say servanthood is not the way to go, that mindset is your kingdom. This upside down kingdom that says the first will be last. The greatest among you will be a servant. God, let us have that kind of mindset where we go through this life and whatever door you open up, we happily go through to help advance your gospel message, which is that you save the worst of sinners, the ones who don't deserve it like myself. And you give us life and you reconcile us back to your Father. And we praise your name because of it, Jesus. Help us to grab a hold of being servants and live that life to the fullest. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you haven't given your heart to, to Jesus, if you haven't started a relationship with him, you're not signing up for some crazy contract with AT&T. You just believe he is who he said he is. And you say, you know what? I can't do this on my own. I cannot live on my own. I cannot save myself on my own. I cannot never be good enough. It's the beauty of our religion. We could never be good enough, but he is. And you start a relationship with him and you give your life over to him. If you haven't done that, I would love to talk with you. Nate would love to talk with you. Christine, who oversees our uh, prayer team, would love to talk with you. Any time during the rest of the service or throughout the week you want to talk to us, please reach out to us. The rest of us, let's stand. Let's worship God. And don't get lost, caught up in making this a concert. It's not a concert, okay? I know you see cool lights, you see a, a nice sound system, you get all these things, and you say, well, it might just be a concert. No, it's collectively, we all come together and we sing praise because God is that good. He deserves your praise. I promise you, I know that kid's heart. He wants you to connect with Jesus and give him praise. So as we go into his gates with thanksgiving in our heart, let's enter his courts with praise. For today is the day that the Lord has made, and I will be glad and I will rejoice in it. Let's worship our creator. Won't you stand and sing?